Hello everybody, welcome to chapter one of anatomy and physiology. And in this chapter, we're gonna be going over some major themes of anatomy and physiology, as well as some directional terms and some region names. Uh, the beginning of anatomy class is really um, a lot of memorization just to get you to understand the language that is used in anatomy courses. Uh, that is really half the battle when, um, when doing an anatomy course is, is understanding um, the terms and then the words that are being used. So let's get right into it. All right, so anatomy and physiology. Um, what is it? What do those words mean? Okay, the term anatomy refers to the study of structures. Okay, so anatomy is the study of structures of the human body and physiology deals with the functions of those structures. Okay, so when we talk about a heart, okay, we're going to be learning about all the structures first we're going to be learning about atrias and ventricles and sinuses and all different types of valves and things like that and then we're going to learn about how uh, those structures function and then once we are done with the structures and functions and we can then talk about how they go wrong how do they function improperly sometimes and cause disease okay what are some ways that we, um, or some sub categories of anatomy and physiology. Okay. Medical imaging, uh, is one of those, uh, ways that we can study anatomy. Okay. These are all different ways that we can study anatomy. Okay. Um, we, and with medical imaging, we can view inside the body without doing surgeries, which is great. Okay. With it's not invasive to go under an MRI or a CAT scan or things like that. Uh, we can do radiology, which is a branch of medicine concerned with imaging. Okay, so if you are a radiologist, you are the person that controls the machines that do the medical imaging. Make make really good money doing that as well. Um, there's gross anatomy. Okay, if anybody ever goes to medical school, okay, there will be a gross anatomy course in which you see and study the structures with your naked eye. Um, typically, that means you get some type of cadaver. Uh, human cadaver, most likely if you're in medical school, um, and you work on that cadaver with a group of other medical students, and you get to see it firsthand what those structures look like, which is always the best way to learn anatomy. Uh, you have histology, which is the examination of tissues. Okay, so um, when you want to look at blood, you want to examine the things that are found in blood, you want to look at um, different types of tissues of the human body, which we'll go through in, a, in another chapter. Um, but you want to study those tissues and how those tissues are affected by disease or by um, illnesses. Okay, that is called histology. Okay, histiopathy or histiopathiology um, is the microscopic examination of tissues for disease. Okay, so it's another, uh, whenever you see histo, okay, that term histo refers to tissues. Okay, cytology is the structure and function of cells. Okay, that is a class all of these are classes in and of themselves, um, but cytology was one of my favorite classes in college uh, when I was getting my master's. Okay, and then you have ultrastructure, okay, which view detailed under electron microscopes. Um, not all colleges and universities have electron microscopes. Uh, the really, really good ones do, the really expensive ones do, um, but you can see really fantastic things under an electron microscope. Okay, some other sub-disciplines of anatomy and physiology are neurophysiology, which is the physiology or the functions of the nervous system. Okay, you have endocrinology, okay, which is the physiology or the functions of hormones, which is a real, really interesting um, sub-discipline of anatomy and physiology, understanding how these hormones work, how they affect you. We don't think about hormones a lot in our everyday lives, um, but hormones have a real, real strong effect on you, whether you produce too much of them or you don't produce enough of them. Um, when they're out of balance, they have a real drastic um, change to your um, physiology. Then you have uh, pathophysiology, which is the mechanisms of disease, which is something that I was really interested in, and especially in today's world with pandemics and all this uh, COVID stuff. Uh, that is a, a very hot topic right now. You have uh, comparative physiology, which is the study of different species and how their bodies function, okay? Um, I took a comparative anatomy course when I was in college and it was really interesting to see how the structures of our nervous system compare to the structures of other uh, organisms' nervous systems and you know their skeletal systems compared to ours and how 
ours function a certain way and how theirs are formed to function uh, and keep their bodies performing in the way they should for them. Okay, such as birds. Bird bones are very similar to human bones, but they are also very different to accommodate for flight and things like that. Okay. Okay, so one thing that we need to know um, is the hierarchy of complexity, which means there's levels of organization that are found in science and especially biology and biological uh, sciences like anatomy and physiology. Okay, so uh, starting down here is the simplest form or the, the least complex and up at the top is the most complex forms. So we start down here, we start off with atoms, right? Atoms like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, Okay, these are all atoms. By themselves, they are not living things, but you don't get any more simple um, as far as um, uh, living things go. And even these things aren't living yet. These are just the parts that can make up living things. Okay, but these atoms, these simple atoms can be put together to form molecules. Okay, these molecules could be proteins. These molecules could be carbs. These particles or molecules could be lipids. It could be DNA could be lots of different molecules, could be water molecules, right? Um, all of these different things are not living on their own, okay? But they are more complex than just atoms, right? You have to have many, many atoms to make these molecules, okay? These molecules can be used and put together in certain ways to make things called organelles, okay? Organelles are little parts of a cell that have a function, right? They could be things called mitochondria, they could be ribosomes, they could be a nucleus. Okay, they can be a whole bunch of things. It can be cell membranes. Let's put mem there. Okay, but what we see, what we're seeing is that these atoms combine to make molecules. These molecules combine to make organelles. So guess what? These organelles are going to combine to make cells. Okay, cells can be eukaryotic, which are things like humans. Okay, they could be prokaryotic, like bacteria, okay, but they are more complex. They are living things. This is our first sign of life, okay, in this hierarchy of complexity. That is, our, that is where life kind of begins at the cellular level, okay, and we're going to study human cells, and we're going to find that there are lots of different types of human cells. There's epithelial cells, there's um, connective tissues, there are, you know, blood and skeletal tissues and all types of other different types of cells, okay? Um, but these cells, these skin cells, these uh, skeletal cells, all these different cells, they can form to make tissues. They come together to make tissues okay, right there, okay? So if I have a uh, stomach cell, okay, here's a stomach cell. That stomach cell, if you put a whole bunch of stomach cells together, okay, it'll make stomach tissue, Okay, so, or muscle tissue, if you were talking about muscles, right? If you, let's say you were eating a steak, right? If you were to take a steak, which is a large piece of a, of a, of a muscle of an animal, and you cut a piece off and put it on your fork, that, that piece of meat that you have on your fork is considered to be a tissue. And that tissue, that, that piece of filet mignon, or that piece of New York strip, or whatever steak cut you're eating, that little piece of tissue that you're eating is made of thousands and thousands and millions of cells of muscle, right? Muscle cells that make up that muscle that you're eating on the fork. Okay. If you take a lot of tissues and what's special about these are like, like cells, cells that do like things that do the same job as one another will form tissues that perform a similar function, right? So muscle cells will combine to make muscle tissue. You don't want to have stomach cells and muscle cells combining together or, you know, heart cells and brain cells combining together to make uh, tissues, you want similar cells that have the same function, right? So all the muscle cells are going to do the same thing. They're going to combine to make muscle tissue. And those tissues can combine to make organs, which are full muscles, right? They can combine to make your biceps, or they can combine to make your um, latissimus dorsi muscles. If this was a stomach, this would be a stomach cell, which would make stomach tissue, which would make the organ of the stomach. If this was heart cells, it would make heart tissue, which would make the heart organ. If this was a liver cell, it would make liver tissues, which would make the organ of a liver, okay, and so on and so forth. When you have a whole bunch of organs that work together to perform a certain task, 
that gives you an organ system. Okay, it gives you an organ system. So let's say, let's go back to the stomach uh, example. If this was a stomach cell, it would make stomach tissue, which would make a stomach, and that stomach is part of, and let me just uh, erase, I don't want to do that. Uh, that, that organ system that the stomach belongs to would be the digestive system, right? And all of the organs in the digestive system are going to work together to digest food, absorb food, get the nutrients into the body, right? So there are other organs involved in this organ system of the digestive system. You have the liver, you have the pancreas, you have the small and large intestines, you have the esophagus, okay? You have all a bunch of different organs that are made of their own tissues, that are made of their own cells, but they all perform the same goal, which is to help digest, so they all belong to the same system, right? We don't see the pancreas um, directly connected to the cardiovascular system, okay? Um, well, that's not true. They, they all kind of are directly connected to the cardiovascular system, but uh, it's not, we don't, can, we don't place the pancreas in the cardiovascular system because its overall uh, function isn't necessarily to circulate blood, which is what this cardiovascular system does. Its job is to help digest food and get nutrients. Now, there is one more level of complexity, which isn't on here, which I want you to know. Uh, and that is if you take a whole bunch of organ systems and you put them all together, that's, what, that's the whole point of this course, right? We want to learn about all the organ systems and how they work together. So how does the cardiovascular work with the digestive and how does that work with the endocrine and how does that work with the lymphatic? Okay. All of the organ systems together, they create what we call an organism, which is in our case, in our class, a human. Okay. So that is the hierarchy of complexity. We start real small with atoms. Atoms make molecules. Molecules make organelles. Organelles make cells. Cells combine to, to form tissues. Those tissues combine to form organs. Those organs combine to make organ systems. Those organ systems work together to keep an organism alive and functioning. Okay, here is that same diagram just with pictures now. Okay, here's our atoms. Our atoms make molecules like DNA, which is what is right here. Okay, these molecules of DNA can combine to make organelles like this mitochondria, organelles such as this and other organelles combine to make cells, cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs come together to form organ systems, organ systems come together to make cute little babies. Okay. Um, anatomical variation is one thing that we wanna just be aware of. Uh, I think this is kind of common sense. No two humans are exactly alike. Um, anatomy books show most common organization of structures. Some individuals lack certain muscles. So these are, you know, when you look at an anatomy textbook, it's, it's telling you about the 99.9% .9 of people uh, that are born with the same structures as 99.9% .9 of other people. Okay, there's always exceptions to rules and there are always gonna be variations within human beings, right? Some individuals lack certain muscles, okay? And these muscles might not be um, very noticeable. They might be very minor muscles, um, but some people are born with them or without them. There's a, there's a muscle in your forearm, okay, that helps you squeeze your hand and open your hand that some people have, some people don't. It doesn't really have an effect on how you use your hand or, or squeeze your hand because you have other muscles that help you do that as well. Um, but there are variations in people, okay? Some people have different number of vertebrae. That's very rare. Okay, most, um, almost all human beings have the same number of vertebrae, 24, um, but sometimes it uh, can happen where people are born with the wrong number, okay? Um, again, on rare occasions, people can have a typical number of organs, right? Uh, some people can be born with one kidney instead of two kidneys. Um, it doesn't, like, again, it doesn't happen very often, and that's why the textbooks don't really show that to you, um, because it's, it's not um, a quote-unquote normal situation, okay? Uh, some individuals' um, organ placement could be wrong, okay? And I'll show you a picture of that in reference to a kidney, okay? Here we have a normal kidney setup, which is 99.9% .9 of all human beings have this normal kidney setup, and here's a normal heart setup, okay, with the blood vessels coming out in certain ways, okay? If we take a look here where we see the pelvic kidney, people can be born with one kidney not necessarily in the correct place, but 
much lower in the pelvis. Okay, we can see here, horseshoe kidney, where the two kidneys uh, have basically become one kidney. Okay, again, very, very extremely rare. And, you know, a lot of times you look at textbooks and they don't show you um, the all the different types of things that you can get because the textbook would be gigantic, right? It would be a huge textbook if it had to, if it had to show you all the different variations that are possible. Here with the heart, we have certain blood vessels coming out in certain orders. That is the normal order. Here we can see that order has changed. Okay. Okay, so, so some characteristics of life. These are very quickly. I want to go through these because you should have learned this in biology courses all throughout high school and, and probably if you took any biology in college as well. Okay, we talked about the organization part with the cells and um, tissues and organs and organ systems. So we got that already. Uh, cellular composition. All living matter is made in from one or more cells, right? So bacteria are single celled organisms. Um, then you have things that are more complex like animals plants, fungi. Fungi can be um, single-celled as well, but they can also be multi-celled. Okay, um, protists, which could be single-celled and multi-celled as well, but all living things have to be at least one or more cells. Okay, we are obviously more than one cell. Okay, we are um, many, many billions of cells. Okay, metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body, okay? Um, so when you build things up, that is part of your metabolism. So when you take in amino acids from drinking a protein shake and you make proteins from those amino acids, that's part of your metabolism. When you eat um, sugar, like when you eat, I don't know, um, a bagel. I'm from New York, so I love my bagels. So when you eat a bagel and you take that wheat and you take that bread and you break it down into its glucose particles, that is also part of your metabolism, the breaking down and building up of uh, substances. Okay, the idea of responsiveness, okay, things respond to external stimuli or even internal stimuli, okay? A stimulus is something that causes a change and, you know, something very obvious and physical would be, you know, if, if you were a ball player or uh, if you're some type of athlete and something's coming towards you, okay, that is a stimulus, right? You have to react to that stimulus. Do I, do I catch that ball? Do I tackle that player? Do I get out of the way? Do I duck and cover? Okay. Um, do I, you know, plan for the next move on the field because I, I have no chance of catching that ball or whatever it is? Okay, that's a, a physical stimulus. Okay, there's also chemical stimuli, right? Um, you can see something that makes you scared; your heart starts beating faster. You could eat something that's sugary; your blood glucose goes higher. Okay, these are all responses to stimuli, and we're going to talk about that more in a couple of slides. Okay, movement. Okay, that's an obvious one. Okay, especially with humans; the humans are always moving. Okay, but it's the ability to change the body positioning of an organism. Okay, um, in our responsiveness examples, there was lots of movement in there, uh, especially on a, on a sports field or something like that. Um, but even if you tried to stay really, really still, your heart's beating, your diaphragm is moving up and down, your lungs are inhaling and exhaling. There's lots of movement going on. Even when you're sleeping, your eyes are going back and forth a lot. Okay, uh, your digestive system basically never stops. Okay. Um, homeostasis is another characteristic of life. That's the maintaining of a stable internal condition. Um, that could be, you know, your body trying to stay at 98.6 degrees. That could be your body trying to, to keep your blood glucose levels at a certain uh, amount as much as it can. Okay. These are all uh, stable in internal conditions. The pH of your blood has to be a stable pH for you to, for you to function properly. Okay. All living things develop. Okay, they differentiate and they grow. Okay, so this when you start off and you are you're one cell and that cell splits into two, you're now different than you were before. And those form into four, and those you know you, you have all these cells creating, and then all of a sudden you got a little a little person in there, right? And that that zygote becomes a fetus, uh, and then that, that fetus is born. Okay, and you grow and develop from there. You, you change in body size. You might have all been between, I don't know, 8 and 10 pounds when you were born. You might have been 15 to 16 inches long when you were born. Okay. And you are much bigger than that now, right? You are, you are way more than 
10 pounds and you were way more than 20 inches long or whatever it was when you were born. Okay. All living things have the ability to reproduce. Now reproduction comes in two forms. You can have uh, asexual and sexual reproduction. Okay. Asexual reproduction deals with uh, things like mitosis. That's your cells making little clones of themselves. When you get injured, okay, your body can create and replace the cells that were injured through mitosis, which is asexual. Asexual has one parent that gives you identical copies. So you start off with one parent and you end up with two identical copies through the division of the nucleus of the cell. Sexual reproduction, however, is very different. Sexual reproduction is when you have two individuals that are different from one another. They combine gametes, which are sex cells, sperm and ova, and they produce an individual that is completely unique. Okay, here, these two cells are identical to the original, where these two cells are different, and this one's even different from those two. Okay, and then you have evolution. Okay, um, living things evolve. Okay, um, when the environment around you dictates what traits are best suited for that particular environment, certain traits can uh, die off or certain traits can proliferate. Okay, and that's what evolution is. It's the proliferation of, of uh, traits best suited for an environment as opposed to traits that are not suited for an environment. Okay. Okay, there's also physiological variations between individuals. Okay, so sex, age, diet, weight, physical activity, genetics, and environment are all things that um, are variations in individuals. Okay, so typical physiological values. Um, a man of 22 years old is around 150 pounds. Whoops, let me go back one. Is around 150 pounds. Um, they typically do light physical activity and consume uh, 2,800 calories a day. Okay, where a woman, a typical woman of the same age, 22 years old, um, is 128 pounds, which is slightly less than the male, okay, and only really eats 2,000 calories a day, okay. Homeostasis, okay, this is something we need to understand, and, and it's, it's relatively easy to understand, and we said before that it was a maintaining of an internal body condition or a stable body condition. So this is the ability for the a change to be detected. Your body detects some type of change. It then activates mechanisms that oppose that change and then brings you back to your normal condition. Okay, this whole idea of, of um, changing it back to normal, okay, it finding the change and then causing it to go back to the normal that's called negative feedback, okay, um, which is going to bring you back down to that normal state. So let's let's take a look at some examples of that so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so one example of this is with body temperature. Okay, uh, if you are too warm, okay, that is a stimulus that your body detects, and that's going to trigger things to happen. Okay, vessels dilate in the skin and you start to sweat, and that sweat should bring you, is trying to bring you back down to your normal state, which we call the negative feedback, right? That, that sweating is trying to bring you back down to normal, and that's attempting a negative feedback situation, okay? Another example, if you're too cold, okay? If you're cold, your blood vessels in your skin constrict, you start to shiver, the shiver makes heat, which is trying to bring you back up in temperature, back to your normal state, and that is called a negative feedback mechanism. Okay, that is just one example. There are many examples of this. Okay, it works just like a furnace or an air conditioner in your house. Okay, you have a thermostat, or you have a room, whoops, let me go back. You have a room, that room um, falls to 19 degrees, which is uh, 19 degrees Celsius. The thermostat is set for 20, degrees Celsius. So once it goes below that, it's going to kick on. That thermostat realizes the stimulus, right? This is the stimulus. The thermostat is a receptor that recognizes that stimulus. It tells the furnace to turn on. The furnace then produces heat. 
the room goes up to 20 and then shuts off the thermostat. And this was called our negative feedback here. This is the negative feedback, getting you back to normal, right? Once that occurs and the thermostat goes off, the room will, over time will cool down. And once it hits below 20, it'll kick back on again. And this is a cycle that happens throughout the day in your house. Okay. Now, if you want to do a body example, here's the body example with the, with the temperature. Okay. Your set point is in the middle. This is your normal temperature, 98.6 degrees. Okay. If you get too hot and that temperature goes up, your body will sweat to, to try to bring you back down to the set point. If you are too cold and your body temperature goes down, your body will shiver, negative feedback to try to get you back up to set point and so on and so forth. You can do this with blood sugar as well, right? If you wake up in the morning, your blood sugar is down here. You wake up, you're hungry, you eat, okay? Your blood sugar goes up. Your body produces insulin to bring it back down. Your body produces energy and uses that food that you ate and you get hungry again because you used up all the food. So you eat again and it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. That is a state of homeostasis, okay? Same thing here. This is when, if you've ever gotten up out of bed really quick or too quickly, your body, sometimes you feel dizzy. Okay, and here's an example of that. Okay, you, you get out of bed. Okay, the blood drains from the upper body, creating a homeostatic imbalance. Okay, your heart has to react to this. Your heart tells your brain what's going on. Your heart, beats, your heart accelerates in response to that drop in blood pressure. Your blood pressure goes back to normal and you feel okay again. Okay, it's, it's a negative feedback loop trying to get you back to normal. Okay, here are some terms that we need to know in this negative feedback loop. So you have receptors. Okay, receptors are structures that sense a change in your body. Okay, so they're going to sense that, that drop in blood pressure. They're going to sense that drop in um, temperature. They're going to sense that increase in blood sugar. Okay, and those receptors are then going to have to tell the control center or the brain about the problem, okay? When the brain has to figure out the problem and try to fix the problem, that's called integration, okay? When your brain integrates the information from the receptors, that's the brain making a decision uh, about that issue and how to fix it. And then the brain tells an effector, which is a cell or an organ, that's going to help bring, apart, bring about that negative feedback and restore you back to homeostasis. Okay, so in the um, cold and hot situation, you had uh, receptors in the skin and in the blood vessels that are going to uh, cause shivering or sweating. Um, and those shivering or sweating, the muscles that shiver are the effectors. The, the skin that sweats is the effector, okay? And the brain had to figure out which one to use, right? That's the brain's job is to figure out which um, course of action is the best. Okay. Okay. Sometimes we have things called positive feedback loops. Okay. Not negative feedback where it's trying to bring you back down to normal, but positive feedback loops are where your body actually tries to intensify the, the change that's occurring. Okay. Um, to, to cause even greater change in the body. Okay? And you're saying to yourself, why would it ever want to do that? Okay, an example of this is childbirth. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so here we have a stimulus. That stimulus is the baby's um, trying to be born, right? And the head of the fetus pushes against the cervix. And once that, that occurs, uh, that typically means that, you know, baby's ready to come out, okay? Instead of what, what a negative feedback would do is would be to stop this from happening. Right. And we don't want that in this case. We want that in terms of blood pressure. We want that in terms of you know, body temperature. We don't necessarily want that in this case. So the head of the fetus pushing on the cervix tells receptors to tell the brain what's going on. The brain knows that the baby's trying to be born. So the, the brain will actually stimulate effectors to cause this to happen even more. Right. So the effector here would be the secretion of um, oxytocin which is a chemical that's going to help dilate your cervix, make the cervix bigger so the baby can come out, okay? And also uh, produce contractions, which is gonna force the baby through the birth canal to be born, 
Okay, so this is a positive feedback loop instead of a negative. It's not trying to stop the product, the stimulus. It's trying to actually um, initiate more of that stimulus so that um, the baby can be born in this particular case. Okay.